everyone and welcome to SG Now. I'm Gladys Bay. And I'm Dennis Stoll. Today we have four interesting stories about people dealing with fashion and cars. Yes, I always talk about these topics, especially right now during the pandemic. It hasn't been easy trying to survive in these industries. Exactly. You know what? I always love to have cars since young and having one now, it really helps me a lot in my work and my lifestyle. Yes, I completely agree. People nowadays definitely look for convenience and things that help make our everyday lives easier. For example, vending machines. Dennis, how many kinds of vending machines have you seen or used before? Mm, well, I've used vending machines for drinks, food, and there are some I've seen before in Japan for fruits, vegetables, cigarettes, condoms, uh, and... Okay, okay, enough. <laughs> But I bet you haven't seen the biggest vending machine in the world, which is actually right here in Singapore. A car vending machine. What? Car vending machine? Where? Right here. Our city girl Kathleen will show you where it is. So let's check it out. Over to you, Kathleen. Hi, this is City Joe Kathleen reporting for Singapore One. Today, we're going to explore the coolest vending machines in Singapore. Come on, let's go. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie and I'm the Head of Communications for Autobahn Motors. Um, I'm the second generation of the business and my family started this business 30 years ago. So I'm very excited to show you more about our special building and the business. Uh, we were facing issues with parking um, as our business was growing, uh, we were taking in more stock. Um, parking has been always, you know, space with parking has always been a problem in Singapore especially. So in order to sort of innovate a solution for us, we really just decided to build it. So we adopted a pick and place system and um, so literally you can put the cars anywhere in the tower and you can take it and retrieve it really quickly. Uh, the other thing is that we have this sort of fishbone system where it really has um, an efficient way of transferring the cars without really having any plates touch each other. So, you know, the machine, the, the tower technology itself is very you know, efficient, very uh, seamless, and very cool. Um, it's, I think it's got a lot of dramatics to it. You know, when a car comes down, um, it takes a while, but you know, when, when it sort of opens up, there's this huge spotlight hitting it, and I think and it spins on the platform. So it's a really sort of dramatic moment, very much like, you know, when you were buying a drink or a, a snack from a vending machine where you really sort of put the coin in and you're anticipating the, the snack or the drink and I think that really is sort of effective we're sort of looking forward to. So what was your quickest transaction? I think uh, I well, I've heard the record is 30 minutes. Um, literally from the time they show the car, you know, bring the bring the car down bring the car back up, have a little chat, and then, you know, a handshake, and that was really the deal. So 30 minutes, I think, was the record. There have been a lot of machines in the city, but this one definitely takes the cake. So this has been City Joe Kathleen reporting for Singapore One. Bye! Thank you, Kathleen. It seems that with the rise of automation, the need for labor-intensive jobs seems to be reduced. While the future may sound exciting for them, the present is less than ideal for some people. Like... Hawkers? Drivers? I agree. They are definitely affected. City Joe Liu is on the case looking into situation with our limo drivers. Let's check it out. The transport industry has been hardly hit by the global pandemic. We all know the impact on taxi drivers and private car hires, but do we really know the impact on limos and drivers? I spoke with two of them to understand how it's like to be a limo driver during pandemic times. Let's meet them. My name is London and uh, this year I am 56 years old, being 
driving a Mercedes taxi for the past nine years. I am Francis Ang, 45 years old, 15 years of a profession as a premium cab driver. What do limo drivers do and who do they serve? Driving a limousine taxi, it's more towards uh, serving the, of these uh, corporate people. Corporate clients are premium clients and then uh, they generally pay more compared to the regular taxi's customer. Now these people, they, they have the need uh, to travel in a Mercedes taxi. For example, uh, company CEOs, uh, upper management uh, personnel, and uh, those uh, bankers. When they are supposed to drink, they are not supposed to drive. So we are there to stand by for the country heads, doctors, CEOs. These people, their families actually, they know us quite well. So they are, they, they feel very uh, secured and safe uh, letting their children ride in our cars by themselves. The pressure has become even greater for drivers with more expats going home and more restrictions in business travel. So comparing to before the pre-pandemic, we have got the airport as the most active area and the profile of the customers would always be more like a international and regional on a daily base as well as a project base. But as to the current, it has already uh, decreased to almost like 10 to 15 percent. There will still be a, a drop of income of uh, between 30 to 40 percent. Right now, everybody is feeling the pinch, but uh, and there are lesser limousine drivers in the market right now. Okay, a lot of uh, drivers have actually uh, returned their cars or maybe they have started driving a regular taxis or maybe they, they move on to driving a grab car, for example, or just left the industry totally. Some of us still manage to make ends meet by uh, taking calls from the company and uh, taking passengers from the street Luckily, we have the authorities allowing us to use the apps on multiple different platforms. Somehow, we have gotten used to using either by meter base on a taxi stand as well as the app base on the go. I would still prefer to stay on and serve a, a small handful of customers and of course, do what I can to feed my family. A, B, C is are being met, as in uh, A, the rental, B, the fuel, surcharges and everything, and C, our own income. The lesson learned is uh, every one of us is uh, dispensable, you know. <laughs> Everybody will actually have to work longer hours and uh, working harder just to get the money. I asked London and Francis what their message would be for fellow drivers, and here's what they have to say. We'll not get back to the pre-pandemic time, but uh, at least things should be better by next year. So hang in there and uh, work hard, especially work for our family. What doesn't kill us would make us stronger. Be optimistic. When there's a will, there's a way especially when the airport is starting to open up now. With more green travel lanes being added, there is greater hope in having more customers for limousine drivers and the rest of those in the transport industry. This is Leo Caballas with Singapore One. Thank you, Leo, for sharing this important story. Everybody is definitely facing their own difficulties, but let's stay positive. When borders open up and the economy picks up, things will get better. Let's continue to support our drivers. Yes, and all kinds of drivers like GrabFood. And Food Panda. Deliveroo. YQ. Food Panda. I said that already. Oops. Never mind. Let's go on to our next story. This next one is an inspiring story about a hijabi model. What's a hijabi model? Basically, it's a person who wears the hijab and models. Okay, I got it. Thank you. It's true, it's what it means. But she is also one of the first hijabi models from Singapore who made it onto the big stage. 
She appeared on Vogue magazines and international runways. Wow, she must be pretty. Let's take a look. Okay, over to you, City Joe Kathleen. Hi, I'm Fahima. I'm a speech therapist by day and I do modeling sometimes. I work with patients with communication as well as swallowing difficulties. For me, speech therapy always comes first. My patients come first and then I work my modeling jobs around it. It's something that I do in my spare time, in my free time, and it's something that keeps me creative, you know, gives me a lot more freedom of expression. So yeah, it's more like a hobby. I started modeling quite uh, coincidentally. I started off as you know, I started off modeling for my cousin who was a fashion design student and you know, they need free models and just someone to uh, do photography class for fashion photography, etc, etc. So that's how I started off. I think I was 18 or 19 at that time. Okay, so my most absolute, most favorite shoot would have to be the Vogue Singapore one. That's really special in my heart because, um, you know, it came out of nowhere. Um, I am a relatively unknown model. Someone just, you know, scouted me on Instagram, asked me if I, you know, would just uh, cast for their video shoot. And then when the video was done and released, like, it went viral. It went somewhat viral and, you know, I had a lot of nice um, comments, a lot of people just um, getting back to me, DMing me and telling me that the video really inspired them, they felt seen. That has got to be my most favourite shoot today. Okay, so can you teach us some poses? Okay, so the first one is the jet staring into the camera. So there's, there's a TikTok video that goes like smile without your eyes, raise your eyebrows, and then stop smiling. So that's your model face. The second one is hands up and painting. So just looking a little bit sick. And the last pose that I like is the over the shoulder shot. So you just kind of stand like this and then look over the shoulders. We've learnt a little bit here and there from Fahima, so my hair is down and I guess it's my turn to try. I think currently the acceptance of the hijab is a lot better. I think uh, hijabi models were unknown or unheard of in the last, probably like in 10-15 years ago, that was probably unknown. There is greater acceptance of the hijab because of the whole idea of diversity and inclusion. Uh, people are realizing that Muslim women, hijabi women are into fashion. They do like uh, looking stylish as well and they do incorporate their hijab um, with fashion. So I think brands are starting to take notice and they are realizing that this is a market that they should be tapping into. To anyone who is aspiring to be a model, I would say take your chances. Always put yourself out there. It may be a free shoot at the start, you know, maybe it's unpaid work. Um, but you know, build your portfolio. Uh, make sure you get exposure and then slowly you will, you know, you'll build things up and then you can finally find some sort of a footing. And don't ever think that, you know, you're too short, too tall, too whatever because nowadays, like the great thing about modelling nowadays is that diversity is the rage word. Uh, you know, people want people who look different, you know, they want a variety of people, they don't just want a pretty face. Uh, they don't just want long hair, like I mean I'm a hijabi model and yeah, take your chances and um, always um, take on any opportunity that comes your way. Thank you Kathleen for your hard work covering another great story. Modeling is definitely difficult. It's not as easy as it looks. Which reminds me, Dennis, you used to be a model too, right? Yes, I went back to modeling for five years ago and I must say it is both physically and mentally challenging. For example, I had to wear thick clothing under the hot sun and I kept asking myself not to sweat. <laughs> I agree. I had the same experience. But it is through these tough times that we met stronger. Speaking about tough times, I know about someone who persevered in the midst of pandemic. He found his own niche and made a better life for himself. City Joe Chris will tell you more. Located right smack in the middle of Tampines retail space, next to Ikea and Cots, is Tea Space. On the second floor of this beautiful industrial building is Auto Stylist. Hello, Singapore. We are now here at Tea Space at Tampines at Auto Stylist. And we're going to hear from the owner himself how he managed to grow his home-based business, an online one, to a physical one like this during COVID. Hi, 
I'm Eric, owning this company, Auto Stylist, since 2015. I'm dealing with brands for Toyota, Nissan, MB200, MB350, parts and accessories. I used to use this to attack people, but now I can use this to control a van, a vehicle. Wow! My parts most probably imported from China as the parts is OEM. OEM is Original Equipment Manufacturer. My business grow from needs, requirement from buyers. Uh. So whatever they need, I will go and search. Once a friend asked me to buy something online through China, so uh, I helped him, helps him to bring in this item and I bought a few as well. Managed to sell in two hours. So from that time onwards, just give me an idea that wow, now's the day online can make business. Slowly, I'll try to bring more parts, more accessories for the individual brand. From start, it was just a room and my house. So once my room totally occupied, I got a second-hand van as a storage also to convenient myself from taking leave. So after two to three years, even my van also cannot, don't have much space. So from one room increased to four rooms today until the fourth year totally occupied. Momo! Wow! Since the COVID started, I have not enough supply for the increase because the demand is too high. Challenges facing is delay of shipment. I have no choice. I need to ask customer to wait. Once items arrive, uh, I will inform them to get the item. You can't overcome for these loss sales. It depends on your luck. From morning until night, you don't know when the buyers is coming. When they choose the wrong item or I may get the wrong item, I have to take extra way to get back home to get the item changed. I'm happy that online sales increase. When I saw these people, after they purchase an item, the merchandise is on, they're happy with their vehicle and I'm happy with my product. Hey bro, I just, <laughs> just noticed you bought this carbon fiber. What's this? Uh, knife. No, for, for, door knife. Door knife, yes. Yeah, so. I want to ask you, how did you get to know about auto stylist? Firstly, my friend introduced me also. Lah. I went to Carousel. Uh -huh, Carousel. Then I went to search uh, door knife and stuff. Okay. So I went, I went to come here to check it out. Then, yeah, lah. so I see the price reasonable, then I just, I just get it. Okay, what do you think about auto stylist? Do you have any reviews for it? Mm, items just are quite cheap and the boss is quite friendly as well. Lah. Okay. So, you can come and check you all, and others can come and check it out as well lah, if they all want right. to. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. To start a business in Singapore is not easy. Uh, it may depend on your luck. It's a very big risk. You need to have capitals to start a business. And slowly you build up your customer base. I take almost six years since my online. Six years. This is your trust from your customer. So most of my customer recommend friends or even though they meet halfway in the middle at the car park, another buyer, somebody will just approach them. They will just recommend me to others. If you want to start a business, try out from small. Unless you are very confident with your business you are doing. Start from small to big. Slowly you upgrade your company. Think big goals and win big success. Isn't this just the right motto for Mr. Eric? And it smells nice too. And this has been your City Joe Chris for Singapore One. Thank you, Chris. No matter how difficult the situation is, people survive. And even come out stronger. This story really shows us how important it is to increase our skill sets and have confidence in ourselves. So, what do you think you need to do, Dennis? Mm, keep smiling. Okay, actually, I guess that is the best thing we can all do right now. 
be confident and keep smiling. Thank you for watching everyone and see you next time. Bye! Bye.